Sweet and moaning Oh Lord It's sweet and moaning Sweet and moaning This is an interview with Reverend George Johnson for the Oral History Project of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. Today is April 13, 1995. We're at Miles College. Reverend Johnson, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and sit with us today to try to uh, help us to develop the real story of Birmingham. Uh, thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Sure. Just want to start just by getting a little background information. Um, what part, where, where were you born? I was bur born in Birmingham, Alabama, in the East Birmingham community, and I've I've lived in that I lived in that community most of my life until 1984, mm -hmm. and I moved to Avondale as pastor of the Zion Spring Baptist Church. Okay. Uh, what part of the state were your, your parents from? My parents were from uh, Union Spring, Alabama, at least my mother was. I, I don't know anything about my, my father, mm -hmm. uh, but my mother was from Union Spring and my brothers and sisters were from Union Spring. I'm the only exception of being born, born oh. in Birmingham. Okay. How many brothers and sisters did you have? I had uh, eight brothers and sisters. Uh, how many older? How many? Younger? Uh, they all were older because I'm I'm the youngest of of the okay. of the nine. Oh, yeah. you're the baby, huh? Yes. Okay. Tell me just a little about your mother. Uh, my mother was uh, a Christian woman, and she reared us. Uh, in the admonition and fear of God, and she did all of her children like that. And there was only one exception uh, to all of us coming to Christ, and that was my oldest brother. He never did confess Christ, but all the others, uh, those who are dead and those who still survive are, are Christians. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did your mother do? My mother, uh, here in Birmingham, she she was more or less uh, uh, not necessarily a maid, but she she uh, collected uh, clothes from from different white families, and she washed them and ironed them, and then we would return them uh, uh, back. We get pick them up on Monday, and then take them back on Thursday uh, before school and so forth, and and she. Uh, so you were intimately involved in, in that process. In the process, my brother and I were involved in the process of picking up and delivering. Right. right. Um, tell me about your educational background. And you started school. Where did you start? I started school? school at the uh, East Birmingham Elementary School. That, that was the initial school. Mm -hmm. And from there... Uh, in the third grade, I went to Kingston School, and that school went from third through the, through the fifth. And when I reached uh, grade six, I went to Thomas School. And uh, of course, I stayed at Thomas School until I finished. And, and in 1937, in January, I graduated and went to Parker High. And at that time, it was so crowded, uh, we uh, had to go to school at 11.30. And in 1938, they opened up Ullman High School, and we transferred from Parker to Ullman. Ullman was a one-year school at that time. That was to the 10th grade? That was in, in, yeah. in the... Uh, it, Ullman went from 9th and 10th okay. grade. Uh -huh. And later on, they made it a full uh, four-year high school. Uh -huh. But I stayed at Ullman one half term and went back to Parker in the 10th grade, and that's where I completed uh -huh. my education at Parker. What did you do after high school? After high school, um, I went north for uh, a few months, 
And um, where did you go? I went to Cleveland, Ohio. Oh. Uh, I, I was. Uh, I wanted to leave the South. I had brothers and sisters in in Cleveland, and they were telling me to come. And I went, and I uh, was disenchanted with. Uh, what I encountered there, you know, I, you I, was, I was I was under the impression I would not encounter the same kind of thing that uh, I encountered here in the South. But upon applying for a job in Cleveland, the first job I applied for, they told me they didn't hire black. And that put a bad taste in my mouth. And mm -hmm. of course, I got a job and worked three or four months. And and, but I was headed back south, and my brother told me, you're a fool to go back. And I said, I'm going back, and I'm going to work and stay in the south until we get things right there. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I am. So you then spent was it three or four months in Cleveland and then returned to Birmingham. Returned to Birmingham. What did you do upon returning? Uh, upon returning uh, in 41, uh, I started working for the NAACP out at Sloss Field. As as uh, it was more or less a school, uh, most of the graduates from Parker went. Those who were in the uh, choir, and I was in the choir at Parker, and they had a choir at Sloss Field. And so, uh, Mr. Henry told those of us who wanted to to go out there, and they would give us a job. And so, I went out to Sloss Field, and I worked there uh, until I uh, was hired at the L and N. What did, you, what did you do at Sloss? Um, I cooked. I was in the cafeteria. I was I, I was a cook in Sloss Field. Sloss. And, and I participated with the choir, with the choir. and we, we traveled and so forth. Oh, okay. What was the group that you... It was the NAAC. I'm uh, not NAAC. Uh, 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 the, uh, I just called it... Uh, NYA choir. Oh, the NYA choir. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't mean NAACP, yes. I mean the NYA choir. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yes. National and, Youth Association. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that was a national organization. It was a national okay. organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how long did you stay there? Oh, uh, approximately nine or ten months. Mm -hmm. And then you went from there to the L&N Railroad. The Railroad. Mm -hmm. And what did you do at the L&N? Um, at the L&N, uh, I went in as a common laborer. And of course, we um, did cleaning and so forth uh, in various places there in in the shop and mm -hmm. other related duties. Right. Yeah. And how long did you stay with L and N? Um, I started there in July, and in uh, in July nineteen, um, um, let me see, forty forty three, July nineteen forty three. And uh, 42, 1942, and I worked there until I was called into service in May of 1943. Mm -hmm. And upon returning in 46, I went back to the L&N. What branch of service did you go into? United States Navy. Into the Navy. Yeah. And what was your job in the Navy? I went in as a apprentice seaman, and uh, when I uh, was discharged after having spent about two years in the South Pacific. Uh, my main duties was uh, ship's cook, and I went in as a apprentice seaman and came out second-class pet officer. Mm -hmm. Did you see any action while you uh, Not necessarily action. I, I was on the ship, uh, but the ship was transferring us from uh, United States to uh, Naval Supply Depot, and that's where I spent uh, about uh, 19 months at the Naval Supply Depot. Then I came to Pearl Harbor and spent about uh, three months there. Mm -hmm. and, and I came back to the States discharged at that time. Mm -hmm. Were there any events that you remember while you were in service that, that uh, sort of stick out in your memory? One, one event, uh, I was on on a list to go to uh, Okinawa, and uh, at that time, I had a special duty of cooking for officers. I was not a steward. I, I was in the seaman branch, but uh, they would take cooks from the seaman branch, and uh, they would cook for officers, and at that time, I was doing that, and when the uh, chief 
my chief saw my name on the list to go to Okinawa for invasion, he said, uh, I'm not going to let you go. I'm, I'm going to get your name off the list, and he did. And, of course, the others went, and in uh, a few months, many of those persons, those who were not killed, returned back to the base, to the Naval Hospital there on that base, wounded and so forth. So that stood out in my mind because maybe I would have been the vic one of the victims had, had uh, I gone to uh, Okinawa for the invasion. Well, you then, you spent two years in, in the Navy? I right? spent 31 months in the Navy. Okay, nearly three years. Huh? Yeah. Okay, and then after you were discharged from the Navy, I went back to L&N. Back to L&N. Yeah, and I started work there, and then I enrolled in Booker T. Washington Business College. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you were, were you married at the time? Um, at the time, uh, I married in 47, and I was discharged in 46. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I started Booker T. Washington in 48. Okay. Now, by this time, of course, the military is about to be desegregated. Right. Uh, there, there are moves. Uh, many of the black uh, servicemen who are returning mm -hmm. were looking at changing the society right. through right. voting and and other means. Right. Uh, did you become a registered voter upon returning to uh, Birmingham? Yes, upon returning, I became a registered voter in 1948 after I started to Booker T. Washington okay. Business College. What prompted you at that time to? Uh, well, one of my one of my instructor was a lawyer that taught me business law, and he impressed upon us to to go and register to vote, and he also told us how we probably could do it without. Uh, a lot of fanfare, and so uh, he told us to use psychology on the registrars, and I applied that type of psychology, and it worked. So I was not given a real hard time. Uh, Did you pass applied. the very first? I time? passed the very first time. Mm -hmm. Who was your instructor that encouraged you? Uh, Philander Butler. He he was he was, uh, and he was a, a an attorney with uh, Dr. Gaston. A business firm, and he also taught business law, and he taught me business law. Okay. Were you at that time a member of the NAACP? Yes, I was. Did you assist in? No, I was a member of the NAACP uh, at that time in 1948. Yes. Did you assist in helping other people to register to vote yeah. as well? Yeah. Uh, after I, I. Uh, was passed and, and everything. Then uh, I was president of our Civic League in East Birmingham, and we proceeded then to get as many persons as we could uh, to register and vote. In fact, we set up a lot of uh, uh, voter registration drives and, and what have you, and there were several persons in the community who were instrumental in helping me as president to, to register the people, and we were very well pleased with the uh, the outcome and those who responded uh, to registering and voting. Of course, we did other things in the community, but mm -hmm. that's that's one thing we're proud of. Mm -hmm. So, voter registration really was a priority. A priority of, of right. the right the community right at that time. At that time, was that uh, a priority around the city, or was it? basically of your community? Uh, around the city, I would say, uh -huh. but uh, specifically in, in East Birmingham. Uh -huh. East Birmingham was sort of a special community. Uh -huh. uh, the families were closely related. Uh -huh. um, this uh, precedes the, the outlawing of the NACP from operating in the state of Alabama. In 1956, that is what happened. Um, how did that impact uh, upon you and your organization? It, it, I, I believe it was, uh, you said 56, uh, I, I was under the impression it was 55 that the NAACP was outlawed. And upon the outlawing of the NAACP, uh, the uh, uh, Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights uh, was organized. Right. To, to carry on the work of the 
NAACP and Reverend Fred Shuttleworth was elected uh, president. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing the plight of the black as related to job, the job situation, uh, after we had been organized and we were meeting over the city, uh, from community to community, from church to were church. You, were you one of the charter members of the Alabama Christian Movement? I'm, I'm not a char I was not a charter member. I was not in the organization, but I came on board after that, mm -hmm. after the, uh, the, uh, uh, the movement was organized. Right. Uh, so you, though, did attend the movement's mass meeting? Yes, I did. And you, did you attend on a regular basis? Yes, on a regular basis. How would you describe the typical mass meeting? Uh, the typical mass meeting was uh, inspirational. There was a lot of enthusiasm. The people were uh, concerned about uh, what they were doing, and I was also concerned, and, and, and we were determined to make things happen in spite of the cost. And so uh, when, when, when uh, Dr. Shuttleworth mentioned that we were going to test uh, the, uh, the, uh, the system mm -hmm. for job and, and uh, go to the personnel, personnel board and apply for a job, uh, the first job mentioned was the job of a police patrolman. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, threw it out to the house and I volunteered to go, and there was uh, another young man by the name of Clyde Jones, who he fell out of the picture a little bit later on after we uh, got things moving. So we applied. Uh, I applied, rather. I was uh, I was a litigant there, and uh, upon reaching uh, the personnel board, uh, Ray Mullen was director of the personnel board, and. I walked up and told him I want to apply for police patrolman. And he looked at me and said, you don't qualify. I mean, just by looking at me. And, and uh, I asked the question then, uh, and uh, why is it I don't qualify? So he showed me the application and said, white only. And uh, It's stated on the application? On the application, white mm -hmm. only. What did you do at that point? At that time, I, I returned, we returned and so forth. I uh, then sent a letter to him asking him to reconsider that, and of course he did not. And we proceeded then to file a suit uh -huh. against the personnel board, the city of Birmingham, uh, and the state of Alabama. Uh -huh. Were you the only litigant? At that, that time, uh -huh. there were two at first, and then uh, 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 after... Clyde Jones dropped out, then I became the only litigant there. How did that then proceed through the courts? Well, we started in, in, in uh, the uh, Jefferson County Court. We went from there to the state of Alabama. And of course, each one, each court refused to mm -hmm. uh, consider it. And finally, it reached federal court. And, and uh, Judge Hobart Grooms, I uh, heard the case, and Attorney Arzell Billingsley uh, was my lawyer. And uh, after uh, pleading the case, uh, Judge Groom ruled that the the words white only would have to come off of the applications and, and the, the, uh, all of the jobs in the city, the county, and the state would be open to blacks. Oh. Then did you proceed to attempt to get... Uh, I at that time, I had passed for Birmingham. I had passed uh, the minimum age oh. limit, and I, I could not even uh, file an application in Birmingham at that time because uh, I had passed that that age. I think it was thirty two, and at that time I was thirty three. But your case was instrumental in getting the white owner removed from the Yes, uh, and the others case. were able to apply not only for a policeman job, but for all of the other jobs that, mm -hmm. that uh, the right. city and the county had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, the issue of policemen was the, act, the very first issue 
that the movement actually dealt with, I believe. As far as, as, jobs, as, far as jobs are concerned. Right. Now, there were sitting in as far as lunch counters and so forth, but as right. far as jobs were concerned, the economics, then, right. that this was the first case. Did you participate in any of the, any of the other demonstrations, such as riding the buses? Uh, I, I participated in the marches. I did not. I did not ride in in the uh, of the buses and so forth, mm -hmm. because at that time uh, I had started pastoring, and and uh, uh, there were some things uh, connected with applying, having received uh, uh, threatening phone calls, and having to sit up and so forth. My uh, my health, my pressure went up and so forth. So I was not able to do uh, too much. Right. Along that line, you know, right. to uh, because of doctor's orders, you know, to he didn't want to be under too much stress. Mm -hmm. You went to the Baptist College, right? Um, I went to Esonian Baptist Seminary, and yes. I uh, became president of that school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition, you you also attended UAB. Is yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended UAB for one year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and also attended a, a Southeastern Bible College mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a year. Right. Um, were there other members of your family that were involved in the movement? No more than moral support. I had, I had my wife and uh, family members were involved morally. Mm -hmm. They supported me, but uh, direct involvement, they were not directly involved in mm -hmm. the movement, but no more than to support me morally. But they did support you. Yes, right. Um, so right. Their, their reaction to your participation was a positive reaction. Yes, a positive reaction. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, were you ever arrested? No. Mm -hmm. The only thing that happened to me was threats, you know, of mm -hmm. bombing. What kind, and what what kind of threats? And uh, economic pressure was applied also. Uh, I uh, was cut off at L and E, and I tried to get jobs at other places. And you mean what do you mean you were cut off at L and N? I, I was the reduction in force and so forth. And uh, so you were one of those. I was one. That of course, I was called back a little bit later on. But uh, the time I was uh, out of a job, uh, I applied at some places, and they just just didn't hire me. You think that was due to your activity with the? Uh, with the movie? I don't know. I, I think it has it had some connection, mm -hmm. uh, but um, during that time, though, uh, the Lord uh, saw fit to call me into the ministry, and mm -hmm. and that was in September 1958, and uh, in January 1959, uh, uh, I was called to my first church. So mm -hmm. uh, the Lord saw fit to employ me, you know, mm -hmm. to, to a call. Right. And so I've been pastoring since that time. Yeah. What church were you initially called to? Uh, I was called the Greater New Bethel Baptist Church in, in the East Birmingham community. So it was a church where uh, I was more or less reared and the people knew me. Mm -hmm. And I was there for 25 years until 1984 when I was called to the church where I am presently. Mm -hmm. Was your church actively involved in the movement? Some of them. Some of them, uh, at least they supported me. Uh, and then there were some who, you know, they they were not directly involved. They had more or less a negative attitude. I don't think it was toward the movement. It was more or less toward, toward me, rather, you know. Mm. Were, were you able to have meetings at your church? No, I did not have any at the church per se because our facilities were not adequate mm -hmm. enough because the church where I was called, uh, it was an old church and we didn't have the facilities. Later on, we built a new sanctuary and so forth. Uh, but um, there was another church of a similar name, uh, uh, New Bethel. I was great in New Bethel. Mm -hmm. And that church was bombed because of the association of my name with that church. And somebody uh, miscalculated, you know. They bombed that church, thought they were going to the church while I was passing. Mm -hmm. Where was this church? It was located about uh, approximately six blocks from where I was passing. In, in East Birmingham? In East Birmingham, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So they miscalculated it. Mm -hmm. and Didn't do much it. damage, more or less, uh, to the front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say, if, if I'd asked you to select maybe the three most important events during the period that we're discussing uh, from 1956 to 1963 when the demonstrations took place, what would those events be? I would say I would say the Alabama Christian movement uh, was perhaps the most important event in the city of Birmingham. Now it laid the groundwork for what happened later. Mm -hmm. Now when Dr. King came aboard, and this is not to take anything from him, but when he came aboard, Reverend Shuttleworth had, had, had pioneered the movement. He had the people organized and so forth. So Dr. King did not have to go through the process, per se, mm -hmm. of getting us organized. He, he had an organization here in Birmingham that was already in place. Mm -hmm. And so he just sort of piggyback on, on, on what was already there. Right. And um, so, the um, moving of the white only from uh, the uh, personnel application was another big event because uh, economic was involved. Mm -hmm. And this gave the blacks a chance mm -hmm. to apply for jobs and receive those jobs. It also opened up. I was also involved in, in litigation concerning uh, the legislature and running for public office along with attorney shows we apply and we were denied so we had to file a suit along that line. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sh uh, attorney shows didn't qualify, I didn't qualify and we filed a suit along that line and of course uh, we won out there and he was able to apply and run for whatever he wanted and everybody else. Was this done through under the auspices of the Alabama Christian Movement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you used a lot of litigation then. Mm -hmm. I was involved in at least two litigation. Mm -hmm. um, in 1961, the Freedom Riders came to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that period? All I remember is that they were beaten. And... Uh, I also remember that uh, on one occasion, after the uh, segregation of seating and restaurants and all of those things were declared illegal, that uh, I attended a meeting in, in, in Mobile, Alabama, and I was to address the convention at that time. What was and I took my church with me. And, and, uh, to Mobile? To Mobile. Okay. What, con co what convention was this? This was the Newer Progressive Baptist State Convention. I was president of the music department. I had to give an annual message. And my choir and other members, we chartered a bus to go. And upon arriving at uh, uh, a certain place en route, uh, uh, I think it's Go Grove Hill, Alabama. Mm -hmm. The driver stopped for a rest, you know, for a rest stop, you know. And we got off of the bus. And, and of course, I assisted the women in getting off the bus. And, and the women went on in the restaurant, not, not knowing uh, that segregation still prevailed there in Grove Hill. And uh, they went in and started using the restroom. And when we got over that, that city, in about 10 minutes, the whole city had gathered there in Grove Hill. And the reason was they thought we were freedom riders. Oh. Was this in 60, 61? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. somewhere along in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, they locked all of the doors and wouldn't, and wouldn't serve us and so forth. Because uh, we got back on the bus and, and moved on out. But I, I just thought how close we came to to being uh, uh, victims of, of uh, segregation, uh, mm -hmm. brutality, and so forth, mm -hmm. like here in Birmingham, because we were thought to have been freedom riders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 62. I don't remember exact, the exact year for that, right. but it was but in it was the in that, 
particular yes, area. Along yes. that time, yes. Yeah. Uh, in 62, uh, the Miles College students and the Alabama Christian Movement um, came together and developed the selective buying campaign downtown, where mm -hmm. they bought cottage mm -hmm. stores. Right. What do you remember about that period? I, I remember that it was very effective. And uh, we uh, supported that movement and so forth, and, and we were able to accomplish what we set out for. And there were persons who were hired uh, by uh, some stores in Birmingham to be clerks and so forth. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you remember about the atmosphere prior to the uh, ending of those segregated facilities? Do you, the, you remember any incidents that you may have been involved with? Uh, you remember riding the buses? Uh, um, any of the, the ways in which segregation manifested itself in the daily lives of people? I didn't, I didn't encounter any. Uh, anything that that was more or less negative, uh, to a large extent, they they accepted it, accepted the fact that we were going to be there and so forth. So, I didn't I didn't encounter anything mm -hmm. negative. What I what I did encounter, though, was uh, I encountered uh, segregation uh, as it relates to the federal government. In, in 63, mm. uh, I, I didn't apply. Uh, I was too old to be a policeman patrolman, so I applied for a job with federal government. And um, I passed the test, and I was called by Social Security. Mm -hmm. And I started working there in, in 63. But what I encountered is that um, they would always doctor the tests, and they had requirements. and and everything that uh, we had to meet in order to to be promoted. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, uh, after having been there uh, several years, uh, they started a, a supervisor program. Uh, from the time I was hired in 63 up until, I believe it was 73, we only had one black supervisor. This is at Social Security? At Social Security. Mm -hmm. okay. And so they, they decided then that they were going to pool, uh, start a pool of, for supervisors. And there were 15 selected, and of those 15, there were three blacks, and I was one of the three blacks. And so my question was, how was I selected? Was I selected on merit? Uh, was I just selected, you know, because they thought I was a, you know, a good so-and-so, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was sure I was selected on merit. But at the same time, the personnel director wanted to uh, give us special attention and write it up all over the paper and so forth. Yeah. And uh, I didn't agree to that. And, you know, these are, this is what Social Security is doing here in Birmingham. And I didn't agree to that because that was a reflection yeah. on the system, also a reflection on us to want to... To, to have that publicity when we knew that they were not doing anything to help to help blacks that much. So and you wouldn't so cooperate? I didn't cooperate, and I didn't receive uh, the position either because oh. I was warned that if I continued to rock the boat that uh, uh -huh. I would not be selected. So you worked for Social Security for about 10 years? 13. For 13 years. I, I, was, I was finally selected, though, because one, one of my tutors asked me why I was not selected because he thought I was the most qualified, you know, having at that time serving as pastor and all of that, you know. And so I told him, and uh, he said that I'm going to check into it, and he did. And in about two months, I was made supervisor. It just shows you how the system works. Mm -hmm. so you, have, you have somebody on the inside that's, that's working for you, you know. Right. So. That's how the system worked. What benefits did you, your family, and community realize as a result of the movement? The only, the only benefit I, I, I have realized is the satisfaction that I have done something to bring all of this to fruition. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm satisfied with myself that I made a contribution. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not satisfied with, uh, with uh, not even the civil rights 
institute because many of us who who were uh, beneficial in getting this stuff started have been overlooked and so forth. And, and, uh, and How do you think it, that should have been done differently, the development of this? I think the persons who were, who were involved should have been, uh, should, 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 should have had some input, you know, uh, Reverend Shuttleworth and, and, and Reverend Woods and so forth. I think they should have been involved in making the selection of persons uh, that they, they should have given the recognition to. Mm. Okay, well, they, they, both of them are on the board of directors. They are now. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and that's one of the reasons that you're probably here now is because you right. were selected right. by that advisory committee mm -hmm. who's doing that. So evidently, the, the word is out that uh, there are people like you who are very concerned about how uh, the selections have been made. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, my wife, my wife mentioned this morning. Says it's been so long, so I wouldn't even worry about it. You know what you've done. So if they didn't, if they didn't give you the recognition at that time. In fact, Robin A. Smith asked me, had I ever received any? I said, No, I haven't. But I know what I did. That's right. And so, I'm, 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 I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, that's why we're doing this so that we can recognize people who've not been recognized, mm -hmm. and and really just to set the record straight. Okay. On the, on the movement that. itself. So uh, this is what we're about, and okay. appreciate you doing it. If you were in control of the movement and could go back and change some things, what would you change? Like what, for instance? During the movement to develop, say, from 56 to 65 or so. I would, I would... Uh, I would be like, uh, I was in the Navy, as I've already said, and we had an admiral that, whose name was Farragut. And when, and when the... Uh, what was his name? Farragut. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he would encounter problems, uh, so forth, you know, of the enemy uh, doing damage, uh, his, 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 his words were, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. So I would say we would do the same thing, maybe with, with more uh, involvement than, than uh, we even had back there then. Mm -hmm. I, I don't regret anything that we did because it took all of that to get us where we are now. What is your assessment of the Birmingham movement? How successful was it? What were the major accomplishments? And were there any failures? The major uh, accomplishments as it relates to the movement? Yes, sir. Well, I think uh, most blacks are aware of the accomplishment who were living at that time, what was then and what is now, you know. that. Uh, but, but there are uh, still prestige of segregation. Uh, we have the rights, but we haven't changed the minds of of too many people yet, you know, that there that, that, that is still white flight. You know. I'm I'm in I'm in a neighborhood where I can I can see it, you know, still white flight. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter uh, how you take care of your property and so forth. They they they, 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 they are still moving and I'm I'm also involved with uh, the Southern Baptists. We have we have a a, a a committee here called Interbaptist uh, Fellowship Committee, and it's a liaison between white Baptists and Southern, and white Baptists and black Baptists, and we try to bring the two together uh, for common good. And we we are, we are really having a problem, and we are starting, and this involves the best they have, the ministers, and yeah. and, and they are afraid, you know, because I, I feel that the black pastor is the only free pastor we have here. The black Baptist pastor is the only free pastor we have here in, uh, involved in our churches, you know, because they, they have to cater to more or less to what their members say, and not, not what the Lord says, but what their members say. And so we're having a problem of trying to bring in programs involving all of them because they're afraid of what their members say, if they get too much involved with us. And so as a result, 
that churches are moving out and, and we are running in getting that churches and so forth, and, which is sort of a sad commentary on, on, on our, our Christian faith. Yes, I guess it's rather ironic that it appears the last bastion of segregation happens to be the church. Happened to be the church. How do we account for that? Uh, I would say that we have we have Christ in 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 our uh, learning. We have Christ. Uh, in our system, but we don't have Christ in our hearts. If Christ was in our heart, then everybody would be a brother. You're you see, we have us. Christ everywhere, but where he should be, and that's, that's in the heart. And I don't say it's on the part of the black, but we, to some extent, we have a lot of it too, you know. Mm. So you're talking about a certain amount of hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Mm. That's a good example of hypocrisy. Mm. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we've not dealt with in relationship to the movement? Uh, we, we, I wouldn't add anything as far as the movement is concerned, but uh, I'm very concerned now at the results of the movement, mm. where we are now, you know. Uh, we... we uh, the the, the uh, white is the white man is not lynching us now. He's not doing this uh, these things to us now. We're doing it to each other, mm-hmm. and it reflects on what has been done. The sacrifices that have been made by many people who have even died for that, and the children now don't know enough about what happened back there. And so our job now is to educate our young people as to uh, where the Lord has brought them from. And I think that's our main job so that uh, we can get back to the, the kind of life that, that we were living because uh, our, our only uh, help um, came from sticking together and working together. Uh, during that time, you know, and, and now we're getting to the point we we hardly know each other. You so, know? so you're saying that we need to teach this history, teach this history, the history of, of the civil rights movement, so That's people right. know from whence we've come. That's right. Do you see the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute playing a role in that? The Birmingham Civil Rights Institute should have a big role in that, but I don't think we should all leave it to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Yeah. Those of us who are pastoring and what have you should see to it that our children, at least, and we should uh, move into the schools and, and let them know. We should contend that uh, uh, history books uh, are written so that our, uh, the civil rights movement would be part of the history, in, more in detail than maybe, uh, I'm not sure we even have in the, in, the, in the black history books now. They did when I was in school, you know, but I'm not sure we even have in the black history books now mm-hmm. that, that would in detail uh, give this kind of information. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's real sad. So how are they going to learn in school when they can't study mm-hmm. the history of, of the blacks? Yeah. There are some, and what we're hoping to do with this material that we're getting now, your interview, for instance, we're hoping at some point that we'll be able to utilize this to write that definitive study of the civil rights movement. And the only way you can do that is by going to the people who were there, who were involved, and okay. that was like you. you. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, sure. What effect has it had uh, I know at one time you and some of the others at, at uh, uh, UAB uh, fought to have uh, a school set up for, for this. Uh-huh. What happened? Well, we're still, uh, still dealing struggling. with that issue. Yeah, okay. We are, okay. We're, there, there are some of us uh, who believe there's a need for a okay. department yeah. of African-American studies. Mm-hmm. That's and, what I meant. And what has happened, 
I developed a program there 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and the program, you can just go so far with that, there's a need now to expand that. And the way that you do that in academia is to develop a, mm -hmm. a department. And the administration basically has been rather resistant to that idea. But we're still struggling with that. And uh, Is there a way that, that we uh, in, in the churches can, can help along that line? You know, is there a separation of... Of, uh, you know. No, it's always important that we have the, the community involved. And as, as it progresses, we will be in touch with people like yourself in the community to try mm -hmm. to get that done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you asking that because mm -hmm. there are not many people that are asking those kinds of questions today. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, do you have any items related to the movement or to the development of Birmingham that you would like to donate to the Institute? Um, I looked today, I had uh, some, uh, I had, uh, I have, and I don't, I don't know where I can put my hands on. I had mm. letters that, that uh, I wrote mm. uh, to the personnel board, and, and uh, I, had, I had a few news clippings. That's about the only thing, because when I talked to Lola, she, she said, we didn't know we were making history, so as a result, we didn't reserve too much, you know. Right, right. And so, and, you know, we're bad on, on, on reserving our history anyway. Right. Well, if you come across any material, you can get in touch with myself, all okay. with Ms. Hendricks, okay. uh, with um, the archivists at, um, okay. at the Institute. And we very much appreciate it. Okay. And again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and for you coming in and sitting with us to help us really develop this story. Because the only way you get the true story is from the people who were involved. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, were one of those. Thank Holly, you again. It has been a pleasure. Sweet.